the Department of Environmental Services. She's a uh, um, limnologist and she coordinates the uh, exotic species program. And she has uh, both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from the University of New Hampshire. She's been working on, on lakes and lake health for over 20 years in the state. So I'm sure she'll have lots of great knowledge to share and, and um, questions that she can answer. Um, and uh, we uh, want to thank all of you for coming tonight and hope that you'll learn something and, and take it with you and uh, maybe join us on the 19th for a, for a paddle around the lake. So thank you, Amy, for joining us and um, take it away. All right. Thank you, Lynn, for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I apologize for not sharing my video. Uh, if I do the video and share my screen at the same time, I have internet glitches, so we want to avoid those. Uh, so tonight I'm going to be presenting on uh, Chikoroa Lake specifically, um, but I know that there are people that are listening to or watching this video and are from other water bodies. So there's no worry there. While the, some of the information is specific to Chikorua, the weed watcher methods are ubiquitous. So they're, they're gonna be applicable to everyone. So the overview, the presentation will take about 40 minutes or so. And I plan to go through why to weed watch, the status of infestations in New Hampshire, some of the methods that weed watchers like to use and some of the recommended methods, I'm going to talk about some of the plants that are native to Chikorua Lake. I'll talk about some of the invasive species, both plants and animals that we don't want in the state or in that lake or any lake or river and show some photos of those. I will talk about how to have specimens identified if you find anything while you're out weed watching. And then I'll talk further about what happens if you do find something and how we respond to a new infestation. So why develop a weed watcher program? It is a very proactive approach at uh, protecting a water body. We actually talk about uh, prevention and early detection as hand in hand proactive approaches. Prevention of new infestations could be participating in New Hampshire Lakes Lake Host Program by having people staff public access sites and educate boaters and hand out materials and do courtesy boat inspections or by having signs at public access sites that are free from the state, telling boaters to clean, drain, and dry their gear before entering and after leaving a water body, or putting out pamphlets or other educational materials. And then the early detection phase is weed watching, and that's catching infestations early before they spread in a water body. That allows the state to facilitate a rapid response so that we can manage that infestation and prevent further spread within that water body and to nearby water bodies. So this is the status of infestations in New Hampshire to date. To the Chikorua area, the closest infestation is in the Danforth and the Ossipee systems, both of those systems it's a total of seven basins, three for the Danforth and three for, I'm uh, sorry, four for the Ospi system. Each of those basins does support variable milfoil growth to some level. So that's not very far from the Chikorua area. There's also some growth of variable milfoil and a little bit of hydrilla nearby in Maine. Uh, so those are fairly close. I don't show those on this map. But those are probably the bigger, nearer threats to, to your particular area of the state. Otherwise, the map gives you a good idea of spread. Interestingly, the northern half of New Hampshire does not have a whole lot of growth yet. We do look for it up there. We just haven't seen it yet for some reason. Our neighboring states of Vermont and Maine both have northern growth of infestations. So it's not unusual for it to be up there but it's just not there yet in New Hampshire. Looking at the map, the red dots indicate variable milfoil growth. That's by far the most common species in the state. It's been in New Hampshire since the 60s and it does continue to spread throughout the state with maybe one, maybe two new infestations of that one a year. 
The other species that are listed here for plants are scattered and lower density in the state, but they're just as concerning as the variable. And then we do have some animals to look for. So I guess the program name Weed Watchers is, is a bit of a misnomer. We should be expanding that name to be more inclusive of other species. We do have seven Asian clam infestations in New Hampshire, and I'll show some pictures of these so you know what they look like. Those are mostly in southern New Hampshire. And then we do have more than 80 sites with the Chinese mystery snail. That one's been around since the mid 80s and is the most widespread invasive aquatic animal in the state. And again, I'll show pictures of these so you are familiar with what they look like. One of the tools that's available to you so that you can, I like to call it spying on your neighbors. This is an interactive map. So if you were to go either through this link that I provide on the bottom right, or simply go into Google and type in NHDES Lake Mapper, you can zoom in on this map and click on any water body in the state. And then this dialogue box, box will pop up. I did this for Chikorua and it tells you basic information that we have on the water body and what reports are available. And if you did have an invasive species, and luckily, and I'm knocking on wood, like Chikorua does not have anything, but if it was a water body that did have an infestation, you would have all the plants listed here or the animals that can be found that are invasive in that water body. Some water bodies in New Hampshire just have one infestation, which is certainly enough. Others have as many as six different types of invasive species competing for space and habitat within the system. So it can get quite bad and the, the, length, the lists can get kind of lengthy. So this is available to you on the website. You can definitely check it out and see what's available for any water body in the state. So weed watching, what is involved? The methods are intended to be simple. We know that everybody is busy and we hope that you fit this into your busy schedules. I actually find weed watching and survey work relaxing. Uh, I tend to go out and look around, um, not only for work, but it's sort of an occupational hazard and a recreational hazard that when I'm out just boating for pleasure, I'm also looking for invasive species uh, because it's fun. You're looking down into the water body and you are looking for something that possibly shouldn't be there and seeing some pretty neat stuff along the way. So volunteers on a water body are trained to monitor their water bodies for invasive species. And I find that lake residents are experts in their water body and they will deny it, say, oh, I don't know what stuff is in there, but they notice changes instantly. That plant wasn't there last year. This is looking a little bigger than it was last year. The lake level is a little shallower or deeper. Um, you guys notice even the most subtle changes. We do ask that you weed watch once a month from May through September, that is, the prime growing time frame for invasive species. And no, you do not need to be an expert in biology or taxonomy or anything like that. Uh, so don't worry about that. It's just repetition and practice that will help you in learning what you should be looking for. We do provide some resources. The Department of Environmental Services provides weed watcher kits at no cost. I do have uh, several kits that should be going to Lynn fairly soon for distribution and uh, you can always reach out to me by email to obtain a kit if you are from a different water body or from Chikoroa and don't yet have a kit. The kit contains suggested methods for weed watching, at which I'll go over here, but they contain, the kit contains written instructions. It does have pictures of key invasive species to look for and fact sheets on a lot of the species so you can read up on key characteristics. And then we also have, like I just showed through the DES Lake Mapper, we have maps of water bodies that include depth maps and historic plant maps. So you sort of have a baseline for some of the weed watching activities that you will be doing. And I'll share some of those as I go through the slideshow so you can see them.
Equipment needs on your end. These are some of the things that are useful to have. Some people like to go out in a small boat with a short shaft, short shaft motor. Um, so if you're on a water body, obviously without motors, you would be using something else. Uh, canoes, kayaks, uh, paddle boards are really popular these days. I have a, a fairly long list here. It's probably not inclusive of all of the different toys that are available for use on the water these days, but it is, it is really something that no matter how you get out there, it's fine. We even have people that like to scuba dive or snorkel to do their weed watching. Whatever fits your comfort level is what I recommend you use. I recommend that you take lake outline maps and pens and pencils with you to take notes while you're out weed watching so that you can keep track of anything important that you might wanna jot down. Take out the plant identification keys and pictures. Those that you'll find in your weed watcher kits are waterproof so that you can get them wet and they will survive uh, for quite a long time. They're on uh, waterproof paper, so that's helpful. I do like to recommend that lakes, and not individuals necessarily, but lakes have one or two long-handled rakes to, to borrow among weed watchers. You can certainly make your own. I would like the ones that you like take an old mop stick or even one of those extendable painter's poles and screw on a three clawed garden rake to it. That lets you reach down to the bottom in deeper water to collect a specimen if you don't wanna get into the water. So it's just a handy little tool to have. Sample baggies, or if you're in a larger vessel, taking a bucket out with you is helpful to put samples in. Uh, if you've ever taken a plant out of a lake and put it onto the bottom of your kayak or canoe, you notice it dries out pretty quickly. So you wanna keep them wet until you can, you can package those up and have identification done. Uh, the polarized glasses are super handy because they help cut the glare from the sun on the surface of the water. And for some reason, given the fact that our lakes tend to have a brownish tinge to them, the brown lenses work better for some reason than the gray lenses of polarized glasses. And you don't need to go with the really expensive polarized glasses. The $10 pair from the drugstore is more than adequate to, to serve the needs for weed watchers. And then a view scope or some other type of viewing device to help you see underwater is also handy so that it also further cuts the glare. This image is not nearly as pretty as Chikorowa Lake or the other lakes that are represented by folks that are watching uh, this video, but it's intended to give you an idea of what to do to break up the water body. I don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed and the need to be responsible for the entire water body. So my recommendation is to break the shoreline up into sections and have volunteers sign up for a section. So for this example here, you see at the top, volunteer Kate took the, the, the top part of the lake and volunteer John has the, the bottom section of the lake. And that's all they're responsible for. They each have their piece, other volunteers have other pieces, and that's what they look at from May through September, just once a month. When they're out there, I recommend that they take a zigzag pattern back and forth, so parallel lines from shore out to doing a pass where you can't see bottom anymore. Or if you wanna go the other way, go from shore out until you can't see anymore and then come back into shore and do a zigzag that way. Whatever method works best for you is what you should use. Uh, while you're out there, I recommend scanning the surface for fragments of plants and then also scan the bottom for anything that might be rooted and growing up from the bottom or any animals that might be down on the bottom. Now for weed watching, you want to go out on days that are fairly calm. It's harder to weed watch on days with wind and waves and ripples on the surface. Uh, it's also better to go out during the high sunlight period. So if you're a morning early, early bird and you want to get your weed watching done early, uh, that will work out better for folks on the shoreline that get sunlight first. Uh, so think about that when you sign up for your sections. Um, the ideal time tends to be between 10 and 2 when the sun is highest and illuminating the water column. 
However, that's also when the wind starts to pick up during the day and you might get more ripples. So it might take a little bit of fine tuning for your water body and your shoreline orientation uh, in terms of the way it faces the sun or not the sun in the morning or afternoon or whenever you're weed watching. So feel it out and see what works best for you. So what are you looking for? Uh, well, anything that looks out of place or new. It wasn't there last month, last year. It might be totally benign, but it's always a good idea to get something like that checked to see if it is an invasive. Anything that appears to be growing quickly and taking over. And just remember, as we start off the growing season from May through June is when a lot of our native plants are coming up and getting established for the season. So you'll notice a period of rapid growth in the spring. So it might be hard to tell during that time frame, you know, what's what, but over the course of the summer, if anything appears to be getting bigger each month, uh, growing very quickly, if you see plants that tend to have a lot of fragments associated with them that are floating around the water body, it could be a sign of an invasive. Uh, any animals like mussels or clams or snails that appear to be very high in number, now I know that there are a lot of lakes in the state that have the big oval brown mussels, uh, the elliptia mussels, and those are the natives. And sometimes there can be big fields of those on the lake bottom, but I'll show you photos of the invasive bivalves that you should be looking for. And they're, they're very different looking and they're also much smaller. And then any animals like clams or mussels that are stuck to surfaces, the zebra mussel, which I'll show you pictures of instead of being down on the bottom, will stick to docks and boat hulls and other hard surfaces underwater. Sort of like barnacles stick to boats in the ocean. Um, zebra mussels stick to hard surfaces in lakes and ponds. So I'll show you pictures of those for what to look for. If you find something, it's important to mark it or get a relative geographic area for it so that if it is something invasive and you, you tell me generally where you found it, I can go and find it again. You can mark it with a buoy. A lot of people use those noodle floats that kids use and they cut them up into small sections and they put a small weight on it. And then you can just wrap a piece of line around it so that they, un they spool out by themselves if you drop it in the water. That's lightweight and handy. Uh, you could use a GPS unit or a GPS app on your phone to get coordinates or to take a waypoint. You can triangulate from a few different spots on shore, but just make sure you take notes of how you do that or, or what points you used. You could flag the shoreline with survey flagging or some other method just so that you get an idea of how to get back to the spot where you think you found something. So after you find something, it's important to take a voucher specimen because especially during the pandemic when staffing is limited, it's difficult to get staff out there to look at something. Uh, and we are also short staffed and limited with what we can do right now. However, if you collect a voucher specimen and get that to us, we can very easily do an identification and sort of triage it so that we know if we need to get out there. And rest assured, if we do verify that it is an invasive, we will literally be up there that day or the next day to do a full survey. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But if it's an animal, I recommend taking only one because we do have some rare animals in the state uh, and preferably photograph it and return it into the water body just so that if it is a rare species, we're not taking it or damaging it. If it's a plant, uh, be careful not to let pieces of it float off. Make sure you collect uh, all the pieces that may have broken off when you collected your specimen. And remember, if there are any stems or leaves or flowers or fruits to collect those as well, because they will help with identification. What to do with your voucher specimen? There are two options. The best right now and actually anytime, especially if you are a person who likes rapid identification and verification, 
is to take a digital picture of the specimen and then email it to me. Place the, spe the specimen on a piece of white paper, paper towel, whatever has a contrasting background. Arrange it so that the leaves or flowers are spread out uh, or the animal is set up so that it could be seen clearly and things aren't all bunched up. Place a coin, pen, or ruler next to the specimen. This just gives me scale so that I have an idea of how big this is, the specimen is. And then just take a digital picture of it and then email it to me. And I'm pretty quick with turnaround for identification of species. The other alternative option is to mail it. Uh, and I would, I would encourage more, again, the, the email of a digital photo. But if that's not an option, you can take the specimen, wrap it in a moist paper towel, and then put it in a resealable baggie and then mail it to me in Concord. And I will get back to you as quickly as the mail and uh, in lab turnaround time will allow. So that is how to, to deal with a voucher specimen. And this applies to anything that you just wanna know, especially if you're new weed watchers. You don't have to assume it's an invasive to send in a voucher specimen. If you just wanna know what something is, feel free just to take a picture and email it to me and I'll let you know what it is. I actually enjoy the trivia. So looking at Chikoro Lake, this is an example of the depth map that we have in our lake assessment reports for New Hampshire. So it gives you a good idea of where the depth zones are in the lake. Chikoro Lake tends to be uh, slightly more tannic in color, so a little bit tea colored. And that means that sunlight doesn't penetrate as deep down as it does in clear colorless lakes. So for you guys, I'm gonna recommend that you focus your weed watching between shore and out to depths of probably 10 feet. That's probably about as deep down as you can see into your lake. And you can see some places like here um, on this shoreline where the, hopefully you can all see my pointer, the depth contours are really tight together, meaning that the depth drops off quickly. So here, weed watchers will have a really easy time because they're gonna have a narrow band of potential plant growth, as opposed to weed watchers who are up in the northwestern end of the pond where the depth zones are spaced far apart, meaning that depths are more gradual and weed watchers will have more of a, a broader zone to look at when they do their weed watching. So factor that in when you are picking the length of the section that you wanna volunteer to do because you might have more work cut out for you in some sections than you would in other sections. And then this is sort of a cheat sheet, if you will. It gives you an idea of all of the native plants that have previously been documented in Chikorua Lake. And again, we have these maps online through the DES Lake Mapper for all of the lakes in the state that are greater than 10 acres. So the symbols here correspond to the key that's provided in the upper right. And you can get an idea of plant density where the letters are clustered closer together. Uh, and many letters all together mean more plants. Whereas if you have fewer letters, that means just a couple plants here or there. And again, Chikoro Lake, as of right now, doesn't have any documented invasive species, so these are all native. What I did was I took photos of each of these. So these are sort of your personal pictorial for Chikoro Lake. And I broke it down into categories. So the emergent plants are the ones that are closer to shore in the shallows. They're rooted down into the sediment and most of the plant material is above the water. So those are all the plants that are sticking up out of the water. So burr reed has, in the upper left, has almost cattail-like leaves, straight up and tall stalks. And then midsummer, they have these spiky little flower stalks on them. Sedges have edges. They have three sides to them if you roll them between your fingers. Pipewort. This one looks like it has a little white button-like tip to it, and it also has a spiky little green carpet that can form on the bottom of the lake, so you might notice that. This is really uh, popular duck food. They like to eat duck and geese food. They like to pop off the tops of these and eat them. This is actually also an indicator of good water quality if you have this plant in your lake. 
rushes are round. So if you roll rushes in between your fingers, their, their stems are very round and they may look like this or slightly different. There are lots of rushes and sedges in New Hampshire. Cattails are very common. They're really good filters and they're really good stabilizers for the shoreline. Hedge hyssop. This one might go unnoticed. It's a really low grower, maybe less than six inches tall in the shallows. And unless it has this little yellow flower on it, you might not even notice it. Uh, it is one that it will only flower when it comes up out of the water. So this might be slightly underwater or it might be fully emergent. Pickerel weed, this is another really common one in the shallows. You might notice that the flower stalks are munched off by midsummer. The Canada geese like to eat these uh, if you happen to have Canada geese on your lake. And then water lobelia, this is a, a delicate little flower. It has these little tall stalks here and nodding pale purple flowers. This is also another indicator of good water quality. So those are all of the native emergent plants or the ones that stick up out of the water that we've documented on Chikoroa. The floating leaved plants, so going out a little bit deeper, uh, you have all your normal ones that you would expect. You have your white and your yellow water lilies. Um, the white ones have round leaves that, if you remember the game Pac-Man, they sort of look like Pac-Man with this little V-knot V shape out of the leaf. And then the yellow water lilies have bigger oval leaves. Um, similar to that, but tiny. These are about the size of a half dollar. These are also heart-shaped. Uh, they are called floating heart, very well named. Those are mixed in uh, with the other lilies. And then water shield, the big oval, not big, it's, it's a fairly small leaf, but they're very oval in shape. They almost look like a shield. And then we have lots of different types of pond weeds in New Hampshire. We actually have 28 different species of native pond weeds in the state. And many of them have floating leaves and then some, some version of an underwater leaf as well. So those are your floating plants. And then taking a look at your underwater plants, these are Fairly common bladderwort species in the state. Most lakes that I work with have at least one or two bladderwort species. This one is fairly large. It doesn't always have this, this tip to it. This is the winter bud or the turian that they produce usually in October going into the winter. But you'll see this growth and bladderworts have these little, they're not seeds, they're actually bellies. Uh, bladderwort is a carnivore and it eats microscopic animals out of the water. So these are little black bellies, but sometimes they can be green or white. And then world bladderwort uh, has these leaves that are whirled around the main stem. It's a little bit different looking. It more looks like kind of clustered growth up here. And the bladders on these tend to be greenish or whitish and they're a little hard to see. So you have some bladderworts. And then I wanted to point out uh, filamentous green algae. A lot of people worry when they see billowing clouds of algae in lakes, and I've seen a lot this year already. This is very normal. It looks like cotton candy or like a big puffy cloud that you would see in the sky, except it's emerald green on your lake bottom. That one is fine. Uh, if you happen to see a scum that looks like the lovely pollen that we're all enduring right now, uh, except it's like a blue greenish color and it's scumming on the surface of the lake. That's something that we want to know about because that could be cyanobacteria or a blue green algae, which could be a concern. But if you see this cotton candy type growth, uh, that is fine. It's not harmful. Uh, so just something to be aware of. Now let's take a look at the invasive species you don't want. So everything I just showed you was totally fine. We're moving into the species that you should actually be weed watching for. And my recommendation is to become familiar with the plants that are known natives in your water body and learn to ignore them and set a filter for anything that is not those, because that's something that you wanna be looking for. You will have some native plant change in your water body, so you may have new species come in that are not bad, but it's always a good idea to check on them. 
when they do come in or you do notice them just to, to rule out a potential invasive. So what I did was I picked invasive species that I thought would be more of a threat to the Chikorua area based on geographic location and chemistry of your water body. Uh, the ubiquitous purple loosestrife is one of them. This one, when you're weed watching, remember to look up at your shoreline for species when you're close to shore. So it's not always about looking into the water. Uh, this one and the next one I'm gonna show you both have moist feet, but not wet feet. So they're not gonna be in the lake, but they'll be around the edge of the lake. Uh, purple loosestrife has been around for a long time with biocontrols using insects. It reduced uh, and it was reduced in abundance for a number of years. But last summer we had a boost of it and I'm not sure what it's gonna do this year. So it's a good one to look for. Purple loosestrife has square stems with opposite or sometimes whorled leaves. And they have these magenta purple spikes that usually will happen sometime mid-July uh, in New Hampshire for you guys where you are in the state. And the significance is that these plants can produce up to two and a half million seeds that are the size of pepper grains during the, during the growing season. So they can spread very quickly. So just keep an eye out for these on your shoreline. Uh, oops, a little too fast for advancing here. So the next one is Phragmites. You may have noticed this one driving around different parts of the state. It definitely likes roadside margins and that's because of the salt that we use on our roads. It likes salty soils. And it's a very tall plant, much taller than any grasses or rushes or sedges we have. It can actually grow 10 or 15 feet tall. And when you get it near a water body, this is what it does. It forms a little stand on shore and then it sends these runners out into the lake or pond. And every point where these runners touch down to bottom, they're gonna anchor and root and send up a new plant. So I've worked with a couple of water bodies where Phragmites has created islands or even peninsulas uh, off the shore in some of those. So start looking for anything really tall with a, a big brown seed head later in the season that might look like this. It's a good one to keep an eye out for on shore. Now, luckily for us, there's really only one floating plant at this time that we should be concerned about for invasive floating plants. This is water chestnut. It's in uh, the Nasher River and the Connecticut River right now, but it can very easily grow in lake systems and pond systems. It can grow to depths of 10 feet tall, and it will typically be mixed in with the water lily zone. The good thing is it doesn't look like any water lilies that we have that are native to New Hampshire. So it should stand out quite easily. It has leaves that are triangular with teeth on them and then they form a rosette that floats on the surface. And it is an annual. So it produces a seed on the underside of the leaves. And the good thing about that is that if, if you get it and we pick it before it goes to seed, we can get rid of it fairly easily. So if we were to chop up all the vegetation, it's not going to spread that way, unlike a lot of other aquatic plants. So it, it does have that benefit. Unfortunately, what it does to water bodies is pretty awful. This is about a foot thick covering portions of the Nasher River. So if you thought you had lily pads that were getting thicker uh, and they were annoying you, this would definitely annoy you. So this is a good one to look out for. Here's a good picture of what the rosette looks like. And each rosette can get to be about the size of a dinner plate. So they can get fairly large. So that one should stand out if you see it pop in. Um, when Lynn was doing the introduction, she mentioned motorboats moving some of these things. And she mentioned canoes and kayaks. This plant actually can be spread by waterfowl those spiny seeds that I showed in the previous photo can get stuck in the breast feathers of birds and they can move that way. So it's a good idea to, to remember this, this could pop up anywhere at any time. So it's a good one to look for. And then moving into the underwater plants, which are always very difficult to identify. 
And I'm gonna give you a heads up that bladderwort, which I mentioned is a native, looks a lot like invasives. It looks a lot like milfoils and fanworts. So take a look at the plant. If you find something suspicious, take a close look at it and see if it has any bladders or bellies on it. If it does, then it's bladderwort. If it doesn't, then it could potentially be an invasive. So that's a, a quick and easy way to tell the difference. This first one here is variable milfoil. So if you remember all of the red dots that I had on the map, variable milfoil is that plant. It's the one that's throughout most of New Hampshire. It grows pretty thick along the stem. The, the leaves grow thick along the stem. And the leaves are feather-like and they're whirled around the main stem, as you see here. And underwater, a good description for this plant is that it looks like a squirrel's tail. So picture a big fluffy gray squirrel's tail and it kind of has that same shape coming up through the water column. These are flowers. Um, they're not very showy, but they are flowers and they do produce seed. Uh, they don't always form though. What you typically are going to be looking for is this. And just another image of it rather dense. Hopefully you don't see it at this level. When you're weed watching, you might just be looking for a single stem of a plant that could be an invasive against a backdrop of native plants in the system. So all these plants back here are all native pond weeds. And then there's this nice little cluster of stems of variable milfoil. And again, that squirrel tail like appearance. And then another shot of it as a pioneering population in a lake just something to get a visual for what you're looking for. Another one uh, that is a good one to look out for, this is as close to Chikorua as um, Mountain Pond in Brookfield, New Hampshire. So a little farther south in the Lake Wentworth area, but it is nearby and it could potentially survive in, in that area. The leaves, if milfoils all have feather-like leaves. We do have some native milfoils in the state that are completely benign, um, but the, all of the milfoils have feather-like leaves whirled around the stem. The way this differs from the variable milfoil that I just showed you is that it's not as bushy and it has bigger gaps between the whorls of leaves. So like an inch or two gap in between each whorl. And then if you, if you painstakingly count the individual pairs of leaflets along a, uh, along a leaf, they will add up to 12 or more on the Eurasian water milfoil. Variable is variable, but it will never have 12. Uh, so those are a couple tips to look for. And then you can see the, the photo on the bottom right here showing you what it looks like in the water. Curly leaf pondweed is another one to look for. So I just said a minute ago, we have about 28 native species of pondweed. This one looks different. This one does tend to like darker bodied, bodied waters in the state. And you can tell this one uh, sort of by a food analogy, I guess. If you think about the edge of a lasagna noodle, that's sort of what the edge of the curly leaf pondweed looks like if you look at it like that. It's this little curly wavy leaf edge. It's crisp like lettuce. It's fairly narrow and this one grows a couple feet tall and it's sort of around knee height in the water column. Very distinctive looking from other plants because of this wavy appearance. And you don't really have this near you but I've been noticing it pop up around the state so I definitely wanted to point it out. And another one, this one seems to like the eastern side of New Hampshire. This is water naiad. Of course, we have a couple water naiads that are native to New Hampshire that could be in Chikorua. And you, I think I do remember seeing some naiad in Chikorua, even though it wasn't listed in your native plant list. So just be aware of that. This one has leaves that curl backwards. This is a good example on the left here. The leaves curl back and they have these little serrations like a steak knife on them. So they're spiny and they recurve. And this is only about six inches tall. So it's this really dense, low growing uh, plant potentially. It typically starts to get going in July, 
the closest water body to Jacorowa is the Milton Three Ponds, so Northeast Pond, Townhouse Pond down in Milton. Uh, not that far away though, so it is one that is fairly nearby. And the last plan I'm going to show you is one that we do not have yet in New Hampshire, but it is one that is highly concerning to me as a state biologist, just because it is starting to spread very rapidly throughout the country. Uh, it's in every state around us except Vermont. So New Hampshire and Vermont right now are two islands in a sea of hydrilla states. Um, this plant can grow 25 feet tall. It can grow in dark waters. So if you looked at the map of Chikorowa, you guys are 25, 30 feet deep, um, but around 30 feet deep. So the potential is for this plant to grow from the bottom all the way up to the surface of Chikorowa Lake for perspective. This one can also, it not only can be transported by boats, but it can also be transported by waterfowl. This tuber down here in the bottom can be eaten by waterfowl, go through their gut system, and come out and still be viable. So high potential for spread by waterfowl. And it does look a lot like our native water weeds. We have two native water weeds in the state. The difference is, if you look up in the upper right photo here, there are serrations on the leaves of the hydrilla. The leaves of the native water weeds are very smooth, so there's a defining factor there. Um, but anything that looks like this should probably have a voucher specimen sent to me for verification, just so that we can rule out anything hydrilla lake yet um, so far in New Hampshire. Oops. Oh boy, going the wrong way. And now we're going to move into some animals. Um, so remember, weed watching is more than just looking for plants these days. Um, for the last few years, it's become increasingly more important to also look for animals or fish or anything else that you might encounter that looks different or new. The Asian clam is in New Hampshire. This one is mostly in southern New Hampshire right now. And it is about the size of a dime or potentially up to the size of a quarter if you were to compare and look for scale. The clamshell is very ridged. So if you think of a ridged potato chip almost, if you run your fingernail over it, you can feel very defined ridges in the shell and that is characteristic of the Asian clam. So you can get a good idea for that. This is what they do to lake bottoms. The, I have seen Asian clam almost 100% cover on lake bottoms and um, in a river bottom in southern New Hampshire. These are all discarded shells in the bottom of Cobbett's Pond down in Wyndham. And these are shells piled up in fish beds early season when the, the fish have their, their nests out there. So the potential here is for impact to the fishery, impact to spawning habitat. And another notorious thing about these is that each Asian clam filter feeds about a pint of water a day. So they're stripping out a lot of the plankton that is the base of the food web. So the benefit to you is clear lakes. The detriment is that the food, which is the base of the food web, the plankton is diminished. So the food web, the aquatic food, food web could be impacted. And they also reproduce um, quickly, so they are also hermaphroditic. So getting one of these into your water body will start a new infestation. So they're, uh, they're savvy little critters. And they will also, in addition to eating your plankton, process nutrients very quickly through their bodies. And if there are a lot of them, that's a lot of nutrient processing and release of nutrients over these clam beds, and that could potentially lead to blue-green algae blooms. So you can see this cascading effect of impacts from the Asian clam. So something to look for. The Chinese mystery snail, this is the one that I mentioned is in an over 80 water bodies in New Hampshire. This one is large. You will know it if you have it. Um, we have a lot of native snails, but they're so tiny, it's hard to find them. These invasive Chinese mystery snails are about the size of an apricot or a golf ball. So they're, they're big. 
so you might see them on the bottom or on a rock, uh, typically not stuck to things, but just kind of moving across the bottom. The zebra mussel, this is the one that I mentioned sticks to things and they're not large. So think about the size of a pistachio nut for scale. So the shells, as you can see in these various photos, they're zebra mussels because they're striped like zebras. Black and white, tan and brown, tan and beige, uh, stripes on the shells. They're sort of D-shaped with one flat side and then they arc out from there. And then these sticky strands right here coming out of this top right photo are what allow it to stick to surfaces. And in the photo on the left, you can see that it's a bunch of zebra mussels stuck to a native mussel, uh, a much larger native mussel for perspective. So these can be quite devastating. They can get several feet thick on surfaces. They can clog drain pipes, cooling engine pipes, black pipes with water withdrawals, um, lots of problems with these. And then the last one I'll mention is the spiny water flea. This one is not here yet, and I should mention the zebra mussel is not here yet either. That one is in Massachusetts and Vermont. Um, the spiny water flea is not here yet. It's in Vermont in Lake Champlain, and it's literally, <laughs> a lot of these are literally a boat ride away. Um, so over on the left is a uh, swivel and a fishing line and a bunch of these spiny water flea attached to the fishing line. And on the right hand side is somebody's finger and you can see the body and this long sharp tail and this is all silica so it's essentially glass. So a lot of our fish species eat um, daphnia which are water fleas which are native. But when they eat the spiny water flea, these silica tails are problematic in the digestion of, of, in their digestive systems. So this could have feeding implications and um, health and vigor um, implications on our fishery. So we are actively monitoring for these in New Hampshire, but we have not seen them yet. So what if you find a new infestation of one of these things or something else? The first step is to get it verified by a state biologist. Um, if the species is non-native, like I said earlier, I'll be up to do a survey um, and map the infestation. We'll try to do containment if that's possible, uh, closing off portions of the water body, um, putting matting down, whatever it might be. We will plan appropriate management acts, actions based on the type and size of the infestation. And if it looks like it's going to be a long-term process to get this under control, we will prepare a long-term management plan for the water body, identifying the problem, the uses of the water body, and any particular concerns that we might have. And the plan will guide management, um, typically for five years at a time. We do have a lot of management techniques for invasive, so it's not the end of the world for the water body if you do find something. I have to be very candid and say that the prognosis for water bodies with invasive aquatic plants is much better than the prognosis for water bodies with invasive aquatic animals. There's not a lot of great techniques out there right now for managing the animals. However, for the plants, we can pretty much dial them in and control them fairly well, either with hand removal or herbicide treatment. The animals are notoriously more difficult because a lot of them have microscopic reproductive phases. They're hard to see and they're hard to manage. And additionally, any herbicides or thing, uh, not herbicides, molluscicides or pesticides that we would use on them could have impacts to native mussels or fish. So. It's not as, I don't wanna say neat of a process, but it's not as target specific, I guess. So we do have options to use um, for different species and we'll use the best techniques that are available. I do wanna point out that one size doesn't fit all for these. Um, so if you have two or three plants, we're not gonna do an herbicide treatment. Whereas if you have acres of plants, we might do an herbicide treatment and not hand pick it. So it, it's sort of relative to the size and type of infestation. 
So the question of, question of funding always comes up. If you do find a new infestation, DES will pay for 100% of the management action for that new infestation. After that though, we do need to rely on match from local groups. That could be a town, a lake association, um, some other entity. So what I like to do is encourage groups to establish a trust fund locally. And there are lots of examples of this around New Hampshire. Um, at varying levels. Different towns have different numbers of lakes or ponds in them or different budgets or sources of funding. Um, some towns have line item budgeting for invasive species management. Others have warrant articles or uh, um, scrap metal recycling, bake sales, all kinds of things to raise funds for uh, combating invasive species. There are some pretty creative ideas out there um, for how they come up with money to match state funds. But we do have state funding each year, uh, but we do have to break that out among a total of more than 90 infested water bodies at this point. And the number of infested water bodies goes up, yet our funding doesn't. So as you can imagine, that little piece of the pie that goes out to all the different groups gets a little smaller every time we find a new infestation. So that's, that's the funding scenario. I also wanna point out that I know a lot of you might be uh, looking for things on land or looking at animals as well uh, on land. So we have three different programs in New Hampshire. The Department of Environmental Services where I work and which I'm representing tonight um, deals with invasive aquatic plants. I also segue a little bit into invasive aquatic animals. Um, however, for those, um, the Fish and Game Department primarily has the purview over invasive aquatic animals, and my counterpart, Scott Decker, there is a good person to chat with about invasive aquatic animals. And then in the middle there, if you are on land and dealing with things like Japanese knotweed or oriental bittersweet or any other terrestrial or on-land plant, or an insect on land like the hemlock woolly adelgid or the um, um, emerald ash borer or other species, uh, Doug Saigan at the Department of Agriculture would be your contact for those. So those are the different contacts for different invasives in the state. And that's it for my formal slides. Um, I'm glad to take questions uh, regarding this content or anything related to that, uh, if there are any questions. People can unmute themselves to ask or ask in the chat box, whatever you prefer. Amy, I'm gonna ask you a question. Of course. Um, is, is, is climate change and warming temperatures, you know, is that something that could have a specific impact? Like as, is that part of maybe why they're moving north or is that not, you know, does that not assist them? Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. It definitely does assist them and it does help them migrate. Uh, so a lot of the things that we're dealing with, um, started down south. The hydrilla that's working its way north um, is a species that originally started to be more problematic down south, um, but it is something that survives quite nicely up north in the cold climate. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, if you look at the history of that plant, it's been found to survive quite nicely in Siberia. So it definitely can survive cold climates too. Um, one of the species that definitely was a more of a warm water species was the Asian clam. They never thought it would survive this far north. And in fact, it's thriving in the St. Lawrence River even farther north, uh, mm -hmm. just fine. So yeah, we are starting to see migration of species, um, some things that aren't even here yet that we're worried about like um, water lettuce and water hyacinth that people put into their home water gardens that don't, they don't even think about them overwintering. They're very tropical and they usually die back as soon as we have temps drop, even in the late summer, early fall. But in some places in the Northern tier, those are starting to overwinter where we never thought they would. 
So little things like that are starting to make, make changes. And as soon as you get a mild winter like the one that we had this past year, that could be the turning point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah. Are any of these invasive species edible? Um, I had an intern who tasted several of them and she's still around. So yes, I do think that some of them are edible but not really tasty. Um, I'm just wondering if it might be a way of getting rid of them to popularize them. <laughs> that, that's an interesting one. That, that's sort of a borderline question though too, because do we want to foster the growth of these to- No, no, it could create that, right. Uh, right. What about the Chinese mystery snail? Not with all the wine and garlic in the world. They have a bad funk to them and they're not very tasty. Why is it called mystery snail? Um, I, that's just the common name that, that, that somebody assigned to it. I haven't. Oh, I just wondered. Nothing, nothing uh, amazing <laughs> about the background of that name, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, Amy, I have a question about the, on the DS lack, uh, lake map, mapper. Um, does it also show the little lake as well with depth maps or just the large lake? Um, is the little lake greater than 10 acres? Ah, uh, probably not. That's probably so, why. Okay. That would be the defining point. So the lake okay. map has lakes and ponds greater than 10 acres and most of our river systems that are, uh, the, we don't have a lot of depths or plant maps on our river systems, but they do show up with other reports. But yeah, our cutoff on lakes is 10 acres. Okay. That's the task for the weed washers is to map the little pond. Ah, okay. Good idea. Because <laughs> um, it, it seems like because they're both connected under the bridge, it would be pretty easy to spread in both directions. So, Absolutely. You're, you are definitely right there. But the nice thing is that a lot of the species you're going to find in the little pond will be the same as the, the big pond, and, as in Chikorua. So once you get comfortable with your weed watching there, you can transfer those skills to the little pond and have the cheat sheet of plants from the, the, the big pond to use as a reference. Yeah, okay. Great, thanks. Sure. I just was a little bit curious about the spiny water flea. You suggested that they're all hard to get rid of, but that looked the most terrifying in a way. <laughs> Has anybody found any way to deal with those? No, not yet. And it, very interestingly, the spiny water flea started out in one portion of Lake Champlain um, at the end of one season and then basically spread throughout much of Champlain the next growing season. Uh, and then a couple years later, the numbers dropped drastically. Mm -hmm. So we don't know if it was at the extent of its range of water chemistry or temperature and it just didn't do well, or there was a population crash for some other reason, but mm -hmm. it's not as numerous as it was before. Um, so there could be some checks like that to a new species coming in. Uh, but I would imagine that some type of pesticide would be needed for a whole water column infestation like that. Mm -hmm. Definitely be challenging. Yeah. Do people have other questions? Anybody? You can unmute if you like. I have another question just about spread. Um, and so waterfowl can spread some of these species because they either ingest the seeds and pass them through their digestive system or they get caught in their feathers. Um, are there other educational things that we should be talking with visitors to the lake about in terms of canoes and kayaks and paddles and boots and things like that? Or is that not really as much of a problem as motorboats and, and native waterfowl in spreading these? That's a really good question, Lynn. And when you think about the invasive plants, those are typically more visible. So you can see them and hand remove them from surfaces. Uh, but they will still get caught around paddles or the keels that some kayaks have. 
Uh, so they are still a risk to your water body, even if you don't have motor boats. But with the invasive animals, those are a risk on anything. Um, sandals that can hold water, fishing mm. lures, uh, bait buckets, live wells, um, literally drops of water. Because these organisms have microscopic larvae, you could have several of them in a drop of water. So our advice to people and for you guys to, to share with folks that come visit Chikoro or, or any water body is to ask if they've arrived clean, drained, and dried. Did they clean off their gear since they were in another water body? Did they dry their gear before they came to your water body and how long has it been dried? Um, did they drain all the water out of their food? Did they tip it over and let everything out, um, all the water out? So those are, those are the questions we like to ask. If they arrive clean, drain, dried, then they're typically in good shape. If they went to another water body nearby in the morning and now they're coming to Chikorua Lake, I might recommend that they go power wash off their gear before they come into your lake or that they use a dilute bleach solution to spray down their gear and let it just sit for a couple of minutes before they, they launch just to, to kill anything that might be on there. So those are just rules of thumb. Okay. So my email address is on here. So if anybody has any additional questions after the fact, uh, feel free anytime just to reach out and ask questions or make recommendations about ideas or thoughts that you might have as you weed watch. Um, I mooch from my weed watchers and share those ideas with other weed watchers. So uh, it's always a learning process and I welcome those thoughts and comments um, and questions along the way. Great. Well, thank you very much for this information. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah, it was fabulous. And for the people here, you know, we've, we're recording this, so this will be available um, online soon so that you can, you know, look at pictures again, check in on it, and share it with friends who lives on, live on lakes. Um, and Amy, there's some thank yous in the chat box, too. I don't know. If oh, thank you. It. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. You might get a flutter of um, 